Welcome to a very special live episode of Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Tuesday, April 2nd. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Akron game in 151 days. The game against Michigan in 242 days. You had a little bit of a live breaking news episode for you here. If you're a member of BuckeyeHell.com, this is not exactly shocking by any means. This is something we've been talking about for quite a while right now, and it was more a matter of when and not if. But now the news has officially broken. Ohio State, according to Pete Thamel, has agreed to a two-year deal with Pete, uh, Carlos Lachlan to be the school's new running backs coach, Lachlan, coming from the Oregon Ducks to Columbus and, of course, replacing Tony Alford, uh, who has departed Ohio State to go to Michigan. Hey, speaking of Tonys, I'm joined by Tony Gerderman of BuckeyeHuddle.com as well as Kevin Noon of BuckeyeHuddle.com. It is just that exciting, a live breaking news episode. We got to bring, we got to have, bring out the three headed monster. Here we are, the Cerberus of the Ohio State football beat. All right, Kevin, let's start with you. What should people know about Carlos Lachlan? He is a coach on, a, on the rise right now. He is not that far removed from being in a support role of working really kind of in the recruiting side of things. He spent a year at Western Kentucky, two years at Oregon. He was part of uh, Dan Lanning's first staff at Oregon, just to signed a new deal to try and keep poachers off of his tail. But uh, I don't think Oregon really thought that any major players were going to be looking for a running backs coach here on April 1st or April 2nd. So his buyout was halved in uh, – on April 1st, but, uh, you know, he seems to really be kind of a fast riser, uh, USC, uh, Tennessee, Miami, I think were some of the schools that were looking at him prior to him signing this deal. So at least in terms of what the perception is, I think that this is a very big move right there. I mean, because let's, let's not forget, I don't want to, I don't want to say everything here in the first three minutes of the show your running backs coach is like a main recruiter. Well, Ohio State has a couple of main recruiters with Brian Hartline and OG Walt, Tim Walton. Uh, if you bring in another guy that's capable of doing some of this stuff, I mean, you know, look out. And this is someone, this has been a sort of a drawn out process. Tony Alfred left after the first two practices of the spring. So, you know, it's been a few weeks at this Ohio State running back position running back coach position has been open and they brought in a couple of very high profile 2025 running backs over the weekend for that student appreciation practice. But Tony, when we talked to Ryan day, like a, what a week ago, he was, he kind of said like, yeah, I expect to have someone in the next week or so. And uh, you know, there had been a bunch of names that had sort of been floated and then hadn't worked, you know, hadn't ended up being true or hadn't worked, ended up going, you know, following through, this was one where when he said, yeah, there's, you know, something you should have someone the next week or so. And then you have Carlos Lachlan out there with this contract where the buyout just happens to drop on April 1st. It was kind of like, mm hmm, I can put two and two together. Yeah. And that was Saturday when Ryan said that. And throughout oh, okay. this entire spring, since that move happened, he's said, you know, we'll, we'll take our time. He did put, he put no time frames on it. And so then in almost, in passing or in conclusion about the question on Saturday, he said, you know, we should have something next week, so, which tells you they had the, the the guy at that point. That's that's the, what, what I took away from it is they had the agreement, but like you said, the buyout, um, if you can save the guy a few hundred thousand dollars, then, uh, you know, you're probably going to do that. Uh, but yeah, as Kevin was saying, like the timing, I wonder what the, how Oregon felt about it or Dan Lanning, you know, you put the, the kind of language in you probably figure you're going to be fine. And then Tony Alfred leaves and you just, you're just like, I wonder if this is going to get to us. Like is, are these dominoes? And, and we saw running backs coach after running backs coach get a nice raise and an extension. And at some point somebody's going to say, you know, what, I will take the job. And I, that's uh, sounds like that's what you got here. Ohio state is not yet confirming though. I have checked. All right, yeah. So we'll uh, we'll maybe they'll wait till till April April second just to make sure there's not a uh, you know not not a any kind of uh, well maybe the language said a, after April first the buyout dropped. So 
Well, uh, well, you know, it, it's it it sounds like it's basically as good as done. And this is something that you know we've been talking about pretty openly on the Huddle Board at BuckeyeHuddle.com with our members for quite a while now. And it sounds like this is a move where this is they brought in, as I mentioned, they brought in a couple very high profile running backs last week. Bo Jackson brought in Jordan Davison out of modern day in California. And this is one, Kevin, where hiring a West, you know, a coach with West Coast ties from a big West Coast program that Jordan Davison was, you know, lo also looking at. This is probably going to help them with, you know, potentially keeping themselves at or near the top of the list for Jordan Davison. Yeah, uh, we have seen, we saw a major crystal ball RPM, whatever the hell it's called, depending on what flavor of site you 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 monitor for that come in for ohio state and jordan davison jordan davison you know there are so many twitter and instagram slews out there that have been following every like and everything else but if if you buy into what they've got this seems to be a very popular move with jordan davison i think that this really solidifies ohio state's chances of landing him breaking the modern day curse and not to kind of get away from it, but I mentioned this internally in our chat. It gives Chris Henry Jr., who just recently transferred to Modern Day, a pro Ohio State person to be around at least for a year. With Henry being a 26 and Davison being a 25, I, I mean, I guess you're on your own, buddy, for, for a year. But, I mean, at least now you have somebody to hang out with and not have to go to USC and UCLA practice and things of that nature. But, yeah, this is... This is big. Oregon had not offered either Marquise Davis or Bo Jackson from in-state, uh, with Jackson being on campus. I have a story that will be coming out in the next 15 to 20 minutes over at Buckeye Huddle talking about the immediate challenges that Carlos Lachlan is going to face reshaping a running back room at Ohio State with Travion Henderson being in his last year, with Quinshawn Judkins being kind of a one-and-done this room is going to look very different. Ohio State going a cycle without even taking a scholarship running back. There's, you know, a lot, a lot there, and I will lay out as I yell at the dog. <laughs> all right. Well, a lot, a lot to, uh, a lot to get, uh, get everyone all excited about with this, this one. And you know, Tony, he just mentioned Trevian Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins and some of the other guys in the current running back room. Those are guys who had a part in this process. They sounds like they kind of helped sign off on this, on this hire. So, you know, theoretically it should be someone who, you know, if it, if the recruits are happy with it and the current roster kind of signed off on it, it seems like internally this should be a pretty much a two thumbs up hire. Yeah. And Ryan Day said that obviously he's going to make the ultimate hire, but he wanted the players feedback. And if the feedback from the players is like, no, 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 no. Then you would think like, okay, he probably would take that into serious account because this guy, your hire, is going to spend more time with these players than anybody outside of Mickey Marotti during the offseason. And so you've got to get somebody that that the players are going to be okay with. And also, it's it's kind of a, a test, a dry run of recruiting. He's He's got to endear himself to these players in, in speed dating terms, basically. And it's not that unlike what you've got to do in recruiting. So it's kind of a nice little test both ways where uh, you can see him in action and also get the real time relay from the players. Like, Hey, what'd you think? Goes, well, how would have gone there? Something like that. So that's an interesting uh, test and uh, opportunity for the players. And then you get that feedback, but I mean, it's going to be very interesting. There were a lot of schools after him over the last few last this past season. This was last year was his third year as a position coach. So this is quite the rise, and James Laurinaitis, this was uh, his, what, uh, this would have been his third year in coaching, and he's he's now a position coach. Brian Hartline was a position coach after, like, 2.2 years, basically. So there is this uh, a decent track record, and it's probably a little early to say that James Laurinaitis is a success because – this is going to be his first full year as a position coach, but it's um, it's not unheard of. the The West Coast stuff is interesting to me because you also have the fact that he was at Florida State in 2020, their high school liaison guy. So he's also involved in Florida high schools 
and which is something that Tony Alfred was involved with as well. So you have this, um, he's got some California to him. He's got some Florida to him. So, and, uh, he, he, you know, he coached at what, uh, Memphis for, for a spell as well. So he's got a nice little several footprint pr- footprints around the country. Yeah, and we got some interesting questions there in the chat. But we're going to start with a super chat from Mike Farino. He said, didn't know his name before this weekend, but after looking him up, I think only Gillespie, that would be the running backs coach at Alabama, uh, would have excited me more. And that was one of the guys who Tony mentioned earlier who, you know, we had sort of been kicking that name around at Buckeye Huddle. And then all of a sudden, uh, Gillespie, just for, for whatever reason, I don't know why, just one of those things that happens, uh, got a raise and ended up uh, not leaving Alabama. Uh, probably a coincidence there. But, you know, yeah, and this is this is a name that I think it feels like unless guys are current, you know, former Ohio State players, you know, when they hired Tim Walton, everyone knew Tim Walton. When they hired Brian uh, Hartline, everyone knew who Brian Hartline was. If you're not bringing in a guy, you know, I don't know how many people knew who Perry Eliano or Keenan Bailey or Justin Fry were before they brought in those guys. So, yeah. They, the life of an, an assistant coach is somewhat anonymous if you're not coaching at, you know, the school that whoever is paying attention to. But, it you know, they have, I think Ryan Day has had a pretty good track record on assistant hires right now where he's he's hit a couple grand slams with assistant hires. And I think he's gotten a couple others where, you know, the, the results are still coming in, but the initial results are pretty positive. So, you know, no one, no one bats a thousand, but it does feel like this is uh, probably – you know, this is probably a, at least a decent hire. And there was a question earlier that you had up there right before we got the super chat about, is this an upgrade from Tony Alford? Is this a downgrade from Tony Alford? And that's an interesting question. I think the fact that, as you said, he has those Florida recruiting ties, that that kind of has some overlap with one of the things that Tony Alford really brought to Ohio State over the years. You know, running back position coach is not, that's not the most technical position. It's not you know, it's not a quarterback's coach where you really got to mess with mechanics or, you know, corners coach or whatever. Running backs coach, that that's not the most technical position. So that is a position where you end up leaning a little more on the recruiting side of things, Kevin. But, you know, obviously this is this is going to be something that we, we all get to watch play out over the next two to three years in front of our faces on the uh, fourth Saturday in uh, in November. But you know, do you have early thoughts on upgrade or downgrade from Tony Alford? You know, I think sometimes pressing the reset button, you get an upgrade just because of that. I mean, Tony Alford had spent, you know, the better part of a decade as Ohio State's uh, running backs coach. And, you know, he certainly he certainly had his biases. He liked he liked so- trying to sign South Florida running backs. Unfortunately, Miami enjoyed that too, and Ohio State missed out on a couple of guys there. So while you do have to play catch-up maybe – don't get too excited about catch-up, Tony. While you do have to catch up in certain places, I think he already has a base in Florida. He already has a base in a lot of instances maybe west of the Rockies. So, you know, I, I think there is an upgrade here uh, because – Tom was exactly right. This is not a case of, oh, I want to get the running back coach who is the best, you know, developer, because that is not necessarily what the position is. There there are two or three spots on a coaching staff that are kind of designated recruiters and running backs coach is one of them. Tight ends coach is another one of them. You have, you, you, I don't care how good you are at, you know, working your position. If you can't recruit, then you know, you got a problem. You're going to have to address that, you know, in a, in a different way. So um, I know there are going to be a lot of people who are still very chapped at Tony Alford and would say that, uh, you know, a, a warm bucket of spit is an upgrade over him. But I think if you can take all the emotion out of it, I think this is going to be an upgrade, but he's going to have to, he's, he's going to have to catch up quickly because he's going to come in for the very end of spring practice. And then he'll be able to do all the stuff that you can do at, over the course of the summer which is recruiting. And then when in fall camp, uh, you know, he'll really get his first chance to really get his hands in the play that will be Trevion Henderson and Quinchon Judkins and everything else. Well, and that's not exactly, I mean, that, that's not exactly like getting just the, the square block of marble and having to carve something out of that. You have a pretty well-formed sculpture already in that running back room for this year. 
So, you you know, yes, he's coming in late. I don't know how big of a concern that is, given that you have more or less a finished product with at least your top two running backs. And then you've got other guys in there who are you know going to be a little more of a project this year. But, you know, and the recruiting seems like, you know, the hay is not in the barn yet, but they're in decent shape with a couple of guys. I thought we had a very interesting conversation on the huddle board at BuckeyeHuddle.com this weekend about Tony Alford and people, you know, as Kevin said, you know, leaving the way he did when he did for where he did, there is going to be sort of a natural backlash to that. And everyone's going to say this guy was terrible and never, never any good. And I don't think that if you go back and look at the reaction to Tony Alford during Tony Alford's time at Ohio state outside of early signing day, when you had a running back flip to Miami in 2023, and then another one flipped to Miami in 20 for the 2024 class, Outside of those times, I don't think you had people saying that Tony Alford was a terrible coach, but he also, Tony, was never, you know, I think you would be hard pressed to go back through the hours and hours and hours and hours and hundreds of hours of podcasts we've done or message board posts we've made and find times that we've said, you know, elite, elite, elite in the way that, you know, you can look at a Brian Hartline and say, like, absolutely elite recruiter and developer. Tim Walton, absolutely elite recruiter and developer. Not everyone is elite. And I don't think you really, you know, Tony Alford was like a solid B plus running backs coach, maybe at Ohio State, where there was some success, there was some development. But if you look at, you know, how many of his guys who he signed as recruits, who went all the way through their careers, ended up getting drafted in the NFL. Is it is it just one? Is it just J.K. Dobbins? Is it just someone I'm missing? I mean, it just you were the running backs coach at Ohio State for nine years, and you had one guy who you signed who went all the way through and got drafted in the NFL. That's not great. That doesn't mean he wasn't good in other areas. He was a good recruiter. He was helpful, and he was a lead recruiter in a lot of cases in Florida. But it, yeah, this is, I think, he he was neither quite as bad as Ohio State fans are acting like he was, nor was he quite as good as Michigan fans are now saying, oh boy, look at, look at the incredible prize that we stole away. You know, the, the draft thing that's going to change probably when Mayan Williams gets drafted, he might get drafted this year. It will change when Travion Henderson gets drafted next year, but from like 15, 2015 when he first started recruiting players to what would be what like you know 2020 2021 where they'd be eligible now you're talking like six or seven classes five six classes where you produced one nfl draft pick and i i think if you talk about that at any position and maybe we should go back and look at each position at ohio state if that's all you're doing that's you're 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 not you're not keeping up i don't think um now only two guys are, are probably playing at a time, but I, I also, I, you know, I've been frustrated at times with him in terms of having players ready, having more than two running backs ready. And this predates the 2022 situation where they had to move chip train them. And at the end of the season, they're running the ball with chip train them, a linebacker who former running like back slash, slash linebacker. And then also Xavier Johnson, you're running them, in the playoffs and you're running them against Michigan. And then the same thing this past year, chip train them obviously is, is still at running back, but this last year, the second leading rusher is chip train them. The third leading rusher is Xavier Johnson that, and, and Dallin Hayden, who looks good at times, hadn't, hasn't, wasn't developed enough to be trusted to play clearly, or else he would have played. And, whether it's a pass blocking or whatever. So I think there were some issues over the years where, um, you know, things just weren't as uh, at the peak that they could have been or that other positions were. And I also wonder, like, uh, with some of the recruiting, like Samson James or James Sampson, Samson James, Samson where, James. you know, he, he committed, but he was never – decommitted and, and let, was let go basically but i don't know what necessarily they i think they missed on that in terms of probably shouldn't have been offered um todd sibley if that was like an urban meyer thing probably early on and i he may have even predated tony alfred in fact but 
some of the um, the recruiting has just been a little wonky, but I think that's that's not atypical. We just saw Brian Hartline lose Javen Boggs, so like things like that happen. But um, the, the the Florida running back stuff just seems like a Lucy and Charlie Brown football situation quite a bit. And it could have yeah. repeated with Byron Lewis this year. I mean, mm-hmm. all because Ohio State was certainly all in on Byron Lewis. Well, we know Tony still is. Tony Alford, that is, because Team Up North just offered him today. So as Tony Gerdeman posted, and so it begins. I mean, because that's going to happen, and uh, he's going to fall for the banana in the tailpipe once again. So here's an interesting one from Mark Adex. Does this affect Dallin Hayden staying one way or another? I mean, I that he couldn't get less playing time under – uh, the new coach than he did under the old coach. So I can't imagine this would hurt having him stay. I mean, I, I don't I don't know that we have enough information yet to make a real firm decision on that. The fact that Dallin Hayden was presumably part of the, you know, had some input on this hire, you would think that might help. You would think the fact that Tony Alford is not there anymore might help. But, you know, there, the, I don't know that I necessarily think that Dallin Hayden's number of reps was based solely on Tony Alfred's decision making and no one else's. So, you know, I, it, it, does anyone have a strong opinion on this one, one way or the other? Because I feel like my answer is kind of. Eh. Yeah, I, I think um, it's. I don't think it's hurt. I don't think his his chances of staying at Ohio State are hurt by this. I think they're only helped by this. Uh, one real quick aside, or back to what Kevin was saying about how a change can just automatically be an upgrade. I would say the same thing for Tony Alford. This could be an upgrade situation for him as well, just because of that new thing and getting out of an old job into a new job and kicking it up a notch. So I think, you know, it, it, we, while we're talking about some of the areas where Tony Alford fell short, maybe Ohio state fell short for him in some areas as well. And so I, I think this is an opportunity for him to, you know, he's going to have some things to prove and, and really be motivated to prove those things, I'll say. All right. I do want to get through. We had a couple uh, we had a, a couple recruits who uh, signed or committed over the weekend, actually four uh, on the uh, Sunday morning show. I took uh, I, sorry, the Monday morning show. I took uh, a couple of shows that Kevin and Mark had put together uh, on two of those uh, two of those commitments and uh, threw those in there. But there are a couple other guys I do want to talk about. So we've already, if you listen to the morning show uh, for Monday morning, you've already heard about the first two commitments of the weekend. But now we want to get to the last two guys to commit. Uh, so you've heard about London Merritt. You've heard about TJ Alford. Let's talk about DZ Jones and Deshaun Stewart, uh, both New Jersey guys, w- which obviously very exciting to me. Uh, let's start with Deshaun Stewart, four-star safety, which which one of you guys wrote that one up? Who has who has the most information on Deshaun Stewart? Probably um, I wrote I wrote it, but Tom, but uh, Kevin can please talk about it if you want. All right, well go ahead and I mean yeah I mean I both of them are out of out of Wayne, New Jersey, which uh, out of a uh, DePaul Catholic. Um, with with uh, Deshaun Stewart, I mean he you know was, was listed in some places as a corner. I think Ohio State is looking at him as a safety, but Ohio State certainly talked to him about all five, you know, all five positions. And that's something that everybody wants to, you know, wants to hear because you don't want to necessarily get stuck behind a Caleb Downs. If you play Caleb Downs's position, you're probably not going to see a lot of playing time. So you show, you know, you show that, that versatility there. And that's something that Stewart has. I mean, Stewart certainly has great size at six, two, uh, buck 85, buck 90 right now. Uh, you know, just shy of 20 offers, but I think that he was somebody that probably, you know, if he let this drag another couple months, could have really blown up, uh, you know, four-star type of kid. But uh, the biggest question that we get is how many defensive backs is Ohio mm-hmm. State going to take? Because you sit there and you look at, you know, you look at the corners that Ohio State has, you look at the players that are still on the board. I mean, you know, you have Fahim Delane, you have Trey McNutt, you have Dorian Brew. I mean, you just you just keep going down through through the list, and you know, let's not even forget the fact that uh, Cleveland Saint Ignatius defensive back just decommitted from uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, and you know, and he's you know being crystal ball to Ohio State. So, 
is this going to be an eight man class? I don't know, but I, you know, I, I talked to some people up in, in, in New Jersey and they really were a big fan of, uh, of, of Stewart's game quote unquote. Yeah. This kid can play is what I was told. So, you know, we'll, we'll see as he progresses and, um, you know what what it looks like because again everybody wants to play corner but you know if he's coming in and he understands that he's a safety but could play any of the positions you know i think that that's good having somebody who's a bit of a swiss army knife but when you look at all of this ohio state has to do a good job of, of keep on recruiting everybody because you don't want to chase off a devin sanchez you don't want to you don't want to chase off a naeem a naeem offered or somebody like that in, in this case, but, uh, you know, I think Ohio state's doing a great job in the secondary recruiting. It feels like for years and years and years, we've talked about, you know, this is the year Ohio state's going to take 28 guys or 27 guys or something like that. And then they always end up at 22 or 23 and we go, how did that happen again? This is a year where, again, it feels like, okay, it's April. So it's time for us to say, this could be the year they take 27 or 28 guys in the class. We might mean it this time. They're recruiting as if they're going to take a big class this year where, you know, they get seven defensive backs and they take five wide receivers maybe because, you know, Brian Hartline is not exactly, you know, hurting for top wide receiver talent. They brought in a couple really highly ranked wide receivers this weekend and it sounds like things are looking, you know, they not bad for either of them. And then you bring in a relatively unheralded three-star wide receiver, you accept a commitment from a relatively unheralded three-star wide receiver out of New Jersey. That to me tells me, number one, Tony Alf or uh, Brian Hartline sees something, which generally when Brian Hartline sees something early, that player turns into Mylon Graham. You know, there, there have been a couple like, who, what kind of offers from uh, Brian Hartline and they have turned into Jackson Smith and Jigba and Mylon Graham. So you know, it's not it's not like this is the first time we've seen this, but it also, you know, they're in on so many other big names, Tony. It feels like you're probably looking at a big wide receiver class as well. And if you're looking at a big defense back class and big wide receiver class, odds are this is going to be a big overall class. Yeah, because you got to remember, Jeremiah Smith's going to challenge the NFL rule after this year. So you're going to want to replace him pretty quickly. Tony, what day is it? All right, just 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 get <laughs> no, the people off no. the ledge, Tony. No, no he's not. not. No, he's I'm not. not. I'm not doing the April Fool stuff. Uh, no, uh, I think to me, I see this this commitment as a replacement of Javen Boggs in the slot. That's kind of what you're looking for there. He's a quick guy, a good route runner, a lot like Boggs. So you've kind of you take care of that, but you do expect to lose guys every year, and you, you sign four, and by the end of their time, one leaves early and for the NFL, one leaves for the portal and you're left with a couple of guys there that you can continue to have to build up. And last year, basically a two-man class or this year, two-man class with Jeremiah Smith and Mylon Graham. And there were times where we thought it was going to be a four-man class. So you're still trying to catch up on that as well. So yeah, four or five guys, I think you could uh, see there. And, and again, they're not deep right now at receiver. So it's not like they're working off of huge numbers. Like they, they were very happy that Bryson Rogers came back because they need bodies. And, and so, uh, yeah, I'm expecting a big class. I, I just keep wondering at some point when we're going to hear from like Ross Dellinger or something about how the competition committee is talking about 95 scholarships now, because 16 games, whatever, you know, it's only going to be a small fraction of teams that are playing that, but, I, I feel like uh, the the power five, uh, the power two, or whatever. Eventually, you're going to see that scholarship number go up. Then you're going to have thirty class, thirty man classes all the time. But it's about time Ohio State has one because it's you know, we, we, like you said, we talk about it every year, and it just doesn't happen. Well, just to jump in quickly too, before we get to the to the super chat about the thirty man classes and ninety five scholarships, it, I do think it's going to have to be something that we see after the split after 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 the big one and the big 10 and the sec kind of go off on their own because they're going to be a lot a lot of other teams that are are, are division one fbs that are going to be like we're having a hard enough time keeping our lights on now now we got to be able to find funding for 10 more scholarships uh and let's remember scholarship is more than just you know room and board and books so i mean i i think that you're going to have a case of until 
the haves are able to separate themselves from the have nots. I think you're going to see, oh, there are a lot of things that make a lot of sense that the have nots are like, well, we just can't have any part of that. And that's why we haven't seen things progress. Yeah. And that's a whole separate conversation, which, you know, I, I think it's probably well past time to stop pretending that Georgia and uh, Ohio State are playing the same sport that Louisiana Monroe is. But, you know, th- where, where does that fault line happen when the big one happens? Is that between the Power Two and the ACC, it, you know, the ACC and Big 12 explode and then there's just two conferences left? Or is there some kind of a schism between the power conferences and the group of five or group of whatever it is at that point conferences? That's all, all TBD. But yeah, I, I do think you're right. I think that broadly, I think you're, you are going to be at some point looking at bigger rosters just because you're asking more players to play more games and eventually they're, you know, the, the demand on 18 year olds, you can, you can, you know, an 18 year old is probably not quite as physically ready for the physical demands of playing that length and intensity of a schedule as a 25 year old in the NFL. Those are kind of two different points in your life. So it will, uh, we'll see how that all shakes out. Super chat for Mike Farino. Speaking of Jeremiah Smith, which we were earlier, the weekly reminder that ESPN should be moved from, removed from the composite number two wide receiver in 2024 class. Insane. This is Tony. I think the player who the feedback on has been the single most consistent of anyone I can ever remember just in terms of, yeah, the high school coaches, the high school uh, talent evaluators, the college coaches, the people inside the program, the people who get to watch practice, like when we just get to go in and watch practice, it's just like everyone has the same reaction and it's just like, oh, oh. And, uh, you know, I wasn't surprised when I saw when we saw what we saw on Saturday, but it was still like, OK. Yeah, OK, we have to say some irresponsible things now. Well, and I, I believe is it Ryan Williams that uh, ESPN has number one who reclassified from 25 to 24. So it's like that was a definitely a choice to put him number one in that regard. Like you could have kept him at two and everybody would be like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, he's he's still a year behind, but you then go ahead and jump him up. I I I swear I remember uh, Shannon Terry, who is the uh, the 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 big guy at on three tweeting about should we have ESPN should we weigh ESPN's rankings less because they spend like less time on it and things like that that in terms of their composite and I don't know if they have or not they do. but it's, yeah. it's weighted but so it is I mean I think 247 in as well it's like mm. they they both love each other and then they've kind of dropped rivals down it's like rivals is only 15 percent of the equation I think ESPN is only 10 percent of the equation if I mm. you know don't quote me on those numbers, but that's what I seem to remember. Well, All right, so 15% back. for – you heard it here first from Kevin Noon. Kevin Noon of BuckeyeHeddle.com, 15% and 10%. Put a graphic up. Quote. <laughs> Sorry, Tony, go ahead. Well, mm-hmm. and I always tell the story about ESPN, how, um, I don't know, maybe like eight, ten years ago, when they did more recruiting, they had like – eight analysts in the Southeast and one analyst in the Midwest. And you're like, well, why are there so many more Florida kids ranked higher than Ohio kids? And it's like, well, it's, you're asking one guy to go cover the entire Midwest and you've got eight different guys that, you know, down in Florida or whatever to handle that. So you're going to just have more numbers because you have more eyeballs down there. But, you know, I, is this clearly ESPN SEC bias? Yes, of course naturally what else would it be all right and before we go it was offensive line day at ohio state both you guys got were there to talk to justin fry and some of the offensive linemen obviously that is a position that has been you know it's not quite wide receiver or corner or quarterback in terms of the excitement level around the ohio state program but it's certainly one where you know we have seen seen seasons derailed by offensive lines that weren't quite up to the standard What's the uh, what's the latest on the offensive line? What was Tony? What was the most interesting thing you heard during the offensive line interviews today? Um, you know, honestly, just listening to uh, Seth McLaughlin and Carson Hinsman were both there. I did not get to listen to Carson Hinsman, but talking about just how the competition is going and 
Seth McLaughlin saying it's not really a competition. They're just mixing and matching, and everybody's just rolling in. So you're just trying to find the best five. And at one point, McLaughlin said, you know, I'm a center. I'm an offensive lineman. Basically, like, I'm not, you know, don't don't worry about just pigeonholing me as a center. And, um, you know, I think uh, Justin Fry asked him about the right side. He's like, you know, we're still trying to figure it out. And uh, I said, well, what do you need to have done by the spring? He's like, well, you just want a body of work and not just a whole bunch of snaps. You want like this many third and eights for each guy in, in terms of the right guard or the right tackle, or mostly the right guard. But you want to have a, a number of snaps from each situation so that you have something to grade on. And then the grade is whatever the grade is. And that's that's how you know basically um, more than just eyeballing it who is better. Well, and we walked away from that student appreciation practice and talked on the the post-practice show that we did. And I think our sense, broadly speaking, was that based on what we saw, it looked like Seth McLaughlin was wrapping more with the ones than Carson Hinson was on Saturday. It's just one practice. It does not mean this is the final answer. And the way they were talking, you know, moving Tegra Shibola into guard a week after Ryan Day had talked about him being more of a tackle – that to me suggests, okay, they feel like Josh Fryer may be that right tackle. Did you hear anything, either of you guys, on Monday to make you think we were reading too much into this and these are still very much, you know, very much wide open position battles? I focused on some other things, so go ahead, Tony, on that no, one. No, no, I, I sat there and I listened, to, I listened to Justin Fry when I got home. And then before I knew it, like I opened my eyes, I was like, what, what was I doing? <laughs> Uh, no, nothing uh, like nothing new there. Um, still, just getting guys wrapped. So nothing definitive. I um, didn't mention Tager in terms of guard or tackle at all. I I, I don't recall. But um, you know, like I said, it's it's fluid. Tomorrow or Wednesday when they're back. Yes, tomorrow <laughs> when they're back at practice, they will. Uh, you know, who knows what it'll be. And um, I'm. He was asked asked if uh, at some point will centers will Hinsman and McLaughlin one of them rep at guard just to see, or he's like, well, how he was asked, how would you know that they could play guard? Like, well, they need to play guard. Like, well, is that going to happen? Eh, you know, like kind of wishy washy on anything like that. So, not a not a bunch of answers coming from Justin Fry, but I I do I still think they have plenty of options to fill whatever concerns they have. And I know so many people, a lot of Buckeye fans are like, they've got to get rid of this guy. They've got to fix that guy. They can't go into a game with uh, Josh Fryer as their right tackle. And I, 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 people just need to put that Missouri cotton bowl game out of the picture because you didn't have your actual center playing in that game. And you had a um, situation on the right side that was not sustainable. So I, I don't think you can use that as any kind of goalpost moving forward. They talk about mm -hmm. taking a game tape and burying it out in the yard. That's one that you bury out in the yard and never go back to it again. Yeah, put that one right next to Jimmy Hoffa and never look at it again. Yeah, that, it, the, the two guys who are were probably at the center of the issues for most of that most of that game are not guys who we're really talking about in terms of being likely starters this year. So, yeah, I would I would kind of leave that one alone and not. Uh, not not have that taint your uh, view of what the offensive line might be in 2024. But well, whoever that offensive line is in 2024, they are going to be blocking for the new running backs coach, Carlos Lachlan's guys. Carlos Lachlan will be not, he's not officially announced yet. And as we said before, we've been talking about this for a while at the, on the huddle board, if I got and it is now to the point where it's public enough that we're going to talk about it here. So we'll uh, you have now gotten your update on Carlos Lachlan. You've gotten your update on, the offensive line. You've gotten your update on the recruiting recent news. You've gotten your op update from Market X on the only good thing from the Cotton Bowl being the pickles. Now we're done. Thank you guys all for joining us. We hope to see you at uh, BuckeyeHuddle.com. If you're watching this live, hit that thumbs up. That'll help other folks find this show. We would appreciate that. Make sure you're also subscribed to our channel and hit that bell so you get notified when we do these live shows because a lot of times something it's something like this where it's like, okay, we have known this is coming for a while, but we don't know we don't know when the alarm is going to go off, and we're going to have to slide down the uh, pole in the uh, podcasting station and get in the uh, podcasting truck and turn on the sirens and go do the show. So, best way to make sure you get you are part of the show when we do that 
is to get hit that bell, get notified, be subscribed to our channel, all that stuff at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. And of course, sign up to become a member at BuckeyeHuddle.com. That's where, again, we've been talking about this stuff for quite a while now. You can uh, get the uh, get the uh, inside information a little before you do uh, on YouTube for uh, this and many other things as well. Lots of stuff going on right now with the, with the team, with recruiting, and much more, all at BuckeyeHuddle.com. That will do it for today. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We will talk to you tomorrow.